Welcome to Codly TV, Mark. And uh, we are at Villa Staff in Mallorca, and uh, you already delivered the talk. And uh, what was it about? Uh, it's called uh, from dependency injection to dependency rejection. Okay. Um, so it sounds like I'm rejecting all this the work that I've been doing with dependency injection uh, so far. Or you know, if you are a casual reader of the title, you might think so. Uh, but that's actually not the point. It's more like. Um, figuring out how does dependency injection actually work in functional programming uh, because I come from this object-oriented background where I wrote a book about dependency injection and uh, you know actually thought quite deeply about dependency injection and then I started doing functional programming with F sharp and I sort of tried to, or I was exploring you know, how does that actually work out in F sharp. Okay and you in, made a statement that I already we already tweeted wrongly <laughs> and <laughs> to, to, to be fair what was the statement? Oh, so, so you're thinking about the, the, the point of dependency injection making everything impure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So basically the thing is that uh, you can think about dependency injection as creating a graph of objects when objects have dependencies that have other dependencies and so on. And that is an object graph that is also a dependency graph. Mm -hmm. And what you normally do with dependency injection is that all the leaf nodes of that graph is where you typically have your, you know, your repositories or your, whatever services you have that, you know, sends email and doing mm -hmm. all this stuff. Um, side effects. Yeah, that does, does, does side effects or do that reads from, you know, does, that does I.O., you know, input mm -hmm. output. And almost by definition, you know, input output and, and side effects is impure, you know, in, in the theory of functional programming, you have this distinction between pure and impure code. Mm -hmm. And the definition of pure code is basically that it can have no side effects and it must be deterministic. So when you have leaf nodes in a graph that are all impure, then it means that the entire graph becomes impure because otherwise um, it wouldn't work. Okay, so, one, one very interesting point that you made was about not uh, not talking about determinism, mm -hmm. instead talking about the uh, same output for same yeah. input. Right. Why? So, so the rule is that we say the a function must always return the same output given the same input. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in normal speech we just call that determinism. Um, but the reason why I explicitly talk about the rule as being the same output for the same input is that um, if you're not used to the terminology, if you come from an object-oriented background, for example, you might say, well, but reading from a file, if I know the contents of the file, that is deterministic because it's not random. It's not random, it's deterministic if you look at the entire context of it. Um, but when you look at the function itself, the function is, we view the function as being isolated from the file in this case. Uh, so, so the point is, you if you give the if you have a function that takes a file name as input and returns the content of, of the file, for mm -hmm. example, um, you could call that function more than one time. And if you change the contents of the file in between, now you have a function that takes the same input but returns a different output every time you call it. So that's why I express it in that way, because that means that that is not a pure function, mm -hmm. even though we could say, but it's deterministic because I understand all the steps that causes the you know, the output to be generated. It's, it's still not what we consider deterministic in this case. And the final approach that you uh, explained uh, was uh, in terms of composition mm -hmm. yeah. uh, instead of a uh, free monad, right. for instance. Yes. So why are you, what, what are your, your points to, 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 to be... To do, to do that instead do of that. a free monad? Yeah. yeah. Well, so um, basically I'm just, I prefer to do things as simple as I can. Mm -hmm. um, and. It's not that I have anything against free monads as mm -hmm. such, but I think there are they're quite difficult to grasp the concept of a free monad, and often you don't need it. And I think if you don't need it, there's no reason to make things more complicated than they have to be. Um, the most of the work that I do is is based on uh, I've been doing REST services for the last mm -hmm. four or five years now. Um, so a REST service in, in its very nature is just, you know, you get an HTTP request and then you have, you know, produce an HTTP response and then that's over. And you should probably be doing that in less than a second, you know, in a couple of hundred milliseconds at most. Um, so that sort of interaction where everything that needs to go on is fairly, you know, isolated and, and has to happen fast often means that you don't have a lot of dependencies. Um, so this sort of what I call an impure, pure, impure sandwich is often enough Mm -hmm. to solve the problems of separating dependencies from from the pure stuff, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, so some people have asked me whether that, you know, that particular style of just composing things together in this impure, pure, impure sandwich, if that always applies. 
And I don't think it does. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I can tell, there you could definitely think of solution, you know, situations where uh, you'd have to do something else, and then the free monad actually comes in as another option. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just that. If you have a, you know, one example of that one might be if you have a long running operation, you know, like for example a desktop application or an mm -hmm. app on a phone that needs mm -hmm. to be running for hours, uh, then you might need to say, well, you could probably not do that, you know, distinct, you know, that that you know sandwich approach to to function mm -hmm. composition. You probably need to do something a little bit more involved, and the free mode might give you that. And can we find any any more information about that? I mean, is your talk recorded? In... Um, the, I, and I don't think they recorded the talk here, but yeah. there is a recording of it from uh, NDC in London uh, okay. from, from a couple of months ago in, okay. in January 2017. Um, so I'm sure you can put a link up, uh, but okay. otherwise, uh, yeah, you can you can go to my Lanyard uh, page, you know, lanyard.com slash plur, and then you can find the link to it there. Okay, perfect. And fight. Just a final question uh, for someone who is just starting to learn a little bit of functional programming. Mm -hmm. What, which resources uh, do we have right. nowadays? Right. That? Well, there's lots of things. I think the first thing you need to figure out is, you know, where do, where are you coming from, and and where do you need to to be going? Because, um, you know, my um, my path through this was that I did a lot of C sharp development. And then I, you know, discovered F sharp. So it, it was a natural next thing for me to do. And then I started looking into Haskell after, you know, being mm -hmm. working with F sharp for a couple of years. So if you're a C sharp developer, for example, I think that is a very natural approach. F sharp is still on .NET and so on. So it's a pretty um, easy to get started with F sharp. And but but if you come from the, you know, Java background, for example, you'd probably go either via Scala or maybe via Clojure, uh, depending. And there's also a new. There's actually a Haskell for for, for the JVM now called ETA. Um, but it's pretty new. I, I don't know a lot about it. But uh, so there's lots of options depending on what you need to do. And if if you're on the JavaScript side, um, again that depends a little bit about you know exactly what are your interests. So if Sharp has a, a compiler called Fable mm -hmm. um, that compiles to JavaScript now, so if you're interested in going that route, you can take that. Uh, but there's also another you know mm -hmm. functional compiler or language called uh, PureScript that some people are mm -hmm. interested in, which is more like an Haskell. On, on the JVM, or not on the JVM, um, on the JavaScript, sorry. Yeah. Um, so so that's, you know, I, I, I probably would say that, you know, trying to go directly to Haskell or maybe even PureScript is probably not the easiest approach you could take mm -hmm. because it, it basically means you have to unlearn everything you already know about, you know, programming and then learn something completely different. Or I think if you go to this middle step of you know, Sharp or Scala, something like that, it's probably going to be easier. Perfect. Thanks a lot for your time, Mark, and have a nice time sure. in Mallorca. Yeah, you too. Thank you.